Welcome back to my series, Dance Mums Uncovered. We're all well aware that some cast members have gotten very entangled with illegal activities and court hearings. But it would surprise you to know just how many legal loopholes were exploited in the making of this show. Because there was more to the show's legal issues than the producers cared to show. Feel free to share your thoughts on the following evidence. First, let's look at lawsuit threats. Recently, the mums have discussed why they couldn't always get away from the drama on the show. Holly explained how they got into their contracts in the first place, confirming what others have claimed in the past. She said that the mums didn't have much time to read over and sign the contracts in season one. They did not initially sign up for a reality show, but a six episode docuseries. Once they were bound by the contract, they couldn't leave without being sued. We all looked at each other because we all signed this contract really fast as we had to. We had very little chance um, to like really think about it. And we signed on because we all thought we were doing a documentary. Docu yes, it's yeah. a docu-series. Melissa says that the producers would threaten to sue them all the time, especially if they didn't go along with a storyline. She says that Jeff Collins threatened her, saying he would own her, her car, her house and her kids. But they threatened us. Remember, they would just threaten us. They got Jeff, at which he doesn't own it anymore. He got in my car and he said, I'll own you. I'll own your car, your house, yeah, that's so your kids. Awful. During the show, Jill says that there was a bus that they had to ride on, but the bathroom stank, so they refused. Michael Hammond tried to get them on and threw threats at them, but Holly stood up to him, refusing to get on the bus. Melissa has mentioned a few times now in the Mums podcast that she didn't send the letter that the Mums received from an attorney. The Mums say that it turned out to be the producers who sent it to them. Remember the bus we wouldn't ride on um, because of the bathroom in the back smelled every, it smelled so bad. We all marched off that bus. He's like, get on that bus. We're like, nope. He's like, I'm going to do this, this and this to you guys and Holly. I love it. You're like, bring it on. They handed you guys paper and said that I sued you all and here's a lawyer letter and it wasn't a lawyer letter. We did get a letter from a lawyer because I had someone respond to it. It was so my lawyer. So whether it was somebody that they found. It's not, it wasn't me. You never knew what was real and what wasn't. And what wasn't. They could have gotten Joe Schmo, someone's brother-in-law to write it. I mean, I don't know. Another original mom, Kathy, was told that if she did enough episodes for the producers, they would let her out of her contract. However, she was told that the show was picked up for a second season, and then the producers went back on their word. Melissa says that it took six months to get out of the Dance Farm's contract, but they managed to do it legally. Another example of manipulation is something that Jill mentioned, where she said that the mums know what it's like to have lawyers and people who are supposed to be fighting for you to be paid off and working against you. She didn't go into any additional detail, but given everything else we've heard, it isn't crazy to assume that the producers may have been involved. So the whole premise was, if I did so many shows for them, and Florida was one of them, where Abby was discussing the girls going on and doing a grand national tour, that if I showed up at that and filmed that episode, that they would let me out of Dance Moms. That fall, I got a phone call that Dance Moms got picked up for another season and that they wanted me back and they weren't going to let me out of the contract because they really liked the material that I brought. I mean, it took me, you know, six months, but I wasn't, you know, and I, that's how I got out. I mean, but we did it legally. You know, we kind of know what it's like when you have an attorney working against you who is supposed to be yeah. for you, but someone is paying them to work against you. Next, let's explore alcohol around children. Abby claims that when the show first started, the mums would put wine in their coffee cups and bring it into her studio. She says that they also hid alcohol in the back office. Kelly adds that the producers would sometimes give her martinis at the makeup chair, especially before a tough day. The mums confirmed that there was a cooler on set near the music room that contained alcohol. You know, the moms used to sit upstairs with those coffee cups wine they were drinking wine 
in my studio. You can't have alcohol hidden in the back office. What if a kid got into that? When I would be sitting at my makeup stand at seven in the morning and they would bring me a martini, I'm like, uh, I have a bad day coming up. I always used to worry because there was like a cooler in the back, like by the music room is. I'm like, what if one of these kids that drives yeah. goes back there and swigs some of the wine or something? The mums think that it was probably illegal to have alcohol on a set with kids. And sure enough, according to the US Department of Labor, children are not allowed to work around alcohol in Pennsylvania. This law was absolutely in place even back in 2011 and is still in effect today. Evidence number three, police involvement. We know that there were plenty of times that the police were contacted on the show. However, there were some instances where they were contacted and it never made it to air. Abby has admitted that she filed a police report against Kathy after their water fight. There was another instance where the police were called during a competition. Kathy claims that she took Jill's phone in the hallway because sometimes the mums would take videos of her mad to try and make her look crazy online. She ended up calling the police, but they just thought it was a funny television situation. I grabbed her phone. Yeah, I remember. Because they were notorious for, you know, the whole point of the show was to cause drama. So, but they were notorious for holding up their phones and videoing, and then they'd slap it on Facebook or they'd mm -hmm. slap it on Instagram or they'd slap it on Twitter and make it look like, oh my God, you were this awful person. They called the police on us. And we were howling because the police were howling too, because they were like, okay, this is a TV show. Like, what are we going to do here? Four, money matters. It isn't surprising that Abby's had the most to say about the ways that the producers would pay the cast members for the show. She has revealed that the cast don't get residuals from being on reality TV because it falls under the category of news content. We don't get residuals because reality TV it's considered news. Over the course of filming the show, Abby boycotted Energy National Dance Competition. She claims that once the owner burst into the dressing room, accusing one of the kids of being a liar. Although Abby told the producers she never wanted to go there again, they would still make them go. She says she tried to get the mums to refuse to go to the competition, but they still went because they were worried about losing their bonus. She ended up really sick and didn't go to the competition which is why she was fined $80,000 by production, which is something she tried to communicate in the reunion special. I boycotted a competition and the woman who owned it, she came into our dressing room, accused one of the girls at the museum of being a liar. Yes. I told the production company, we're never going to that again. Sure enough, they have us going to the competition. I said, I'm not going. I was really sick. I had all this like cramping in my legs and the paramedics had to come to my hotel room. It was awful. And I was fined $80,000. And the mothers were so afraid they were going to not get their bonus. Abby also suggests that her accountant and attorney were somehow responsible for her legal issues that landed her in jail. Like if I would have paid attention to what my accountant was doing and paid attention to what my attorney was doing, I'd have been a lot better off. A lot of people assume that Abby was only put in jail because of the money she snuck into the US from Australia. However, according to court documents, there were several other things that Abby did to conceal her income that she would have been caught for doing anyway. Allegedly, Abby didn't tell the courts that she was earning money from dance mums and she was having her income from the show paid to two small corporations that she created called No Tears Productions and Abby Lee Enterprise. She did this to avoid having to pay back the debts that she owed to various financial institutions after going bankrupt in 2010. She even got the producers to hold her money for her or to pay large amounts to her mother's account so that the money in her account wouldn't go up and she wouldn't have to pay back the people she owes money to. And the documents accuse Abby of doing this on purpose because of some of the emails that she had sent. It quotes one of her emails where she said, let's make money and keep me out of jail. Apparently she also hid income from masterclasses and merchandise sales as well. So while Abby continues to insist that she is a victim who made a mistake in trusting the wrong people, 
perhaps she really did know exactly what she was doing. And of course, the document also says that Abby snuck around 120,000 Australian dollars into the country, using miners to hide it. Then it says that they have an eyewitness testimony and a picture to prove that this happened, which might suggest that someone close to Abby spilt the beans on her, perhaps Melissa, just like Abby suspects. And finally, we have illegal hours. I have discussed the horrendous working hours that the kids on this show were subjected to before, but even more information about this has come out, and it's become more clear than ever how brutal this schedule was for them. During early seasons, the cast would have to wake up at 4am to catch the bus at 6. They would then sometimes spend all night on the bus, travelling to the competition destination. Melissa says that there were no child labour laws in place for reality TV when they first began the show. She says that even when they did come into effect, the producers didn't always follow them and would lie about the hours that the kids worked. We'd have to get up at 4 a.m. to get on the bus, to have their makeup done and get on the bus by 6 to get to the competition. Yeah. Traveling all night, on a bus, sleeping on the bus. They would into lie a about the hours. Before, um, you know, child um, labor laws. Labor got laws came in effect for you know, reality, because remember, we didn't have it. They did not follow the law until season two and a half, maybe. Sometimes the girls were so busy throughout the day that they didn't even have time to shower. They were at the studio from the time school ended until 10, 11, or even 12 at night, which was long after the staff had left. In total, the girls would sometimes work 10 to 12 hours a day. Melissa recounts an instance where Maddie was still learning her solo at midnight. The mums say that the producers would sometimes not let their kids leave until they fought. I don't even know when the hell they had time to shower. You yeah. know, I mean, sometimes they, they didn't. They, I would pick them up at school. They'd eat in the car. We'd go straight to practice. Our kids were at the studio till 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. Yeah. Everybody would leave. The teachers would leave, but they were they had, they had to, to stay, stay and practice. These kids work 10 to 12 hours a day mm -hmm. and in school on top of that. Maddie was learning a, a solo at midnight and I pulled her and they were like, no, no. I'm like, it's midnight. But that's why we'd fight all the time. It's because they told us you're not allowed to leave until you fight. Kira also described a situation that occurred during their time in Australia where she fought with one of the producers. She says that they began filming immediately after a 13 hour flight. The trip had caused the kids to fall behind in school, but the producers said that it didn't matter because child labor laws and schooling laws are different internationally. I got in the biggest fight ever with our producer there. We had no sleep. Oh. We arrived on a red eye and went straight into filming after 13 hours on a plane. Our kids hadn't done school in like three days. And they're like, we're in a different country. We don't have to apply the school laws as we do in the US. So what do you guys think? Does it shock you that there were so many legally questionable activities going on in an environment filled with children? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.